Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America and Ruta Finn. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And totally aside from the pleasure I have whenever I return to Columbia University's highly regarded Teachers College, I have the opportunity to recruit guests for this program whenever I'm invited there to moderate TC's Distinguished Book Talk series. And that's precisely what happened when I conducted a book talk some months ago with David L. Kirp, professor of public policy at the University of California at Berkeley about his intriguing Harvard University Press volume, Shakespeare, Einstein, and the bottom line, the marketing of higher education. Now, my guest, I should note, has been very much around the block academically and otherwise. A civil rights attorney early in his career, after more than three decades as a professor at Berkeley and Harvard, he also knows about higher education close up, which is why I would ask David Kirp whose book seems generally to show a not-so-disapproving attitude toward truly smart academic entrepreneurs, just what does disturb him about joining together Shakespeare, Einstein, and the bottom line? What is it that gets you? Well, it's a great question to begin with because, indeed, um, it's that fine balance between Shakespeare and the bottom line that those who succeed in this new world of higher education, not our world, but the world of today, manage to walk. And those who fail, what troubles me is the bottom line winds up running everything, not just the need for money. Uh, universities have always needed money. If that weren't true, the word legacy wouldn't have such a special meaning in higher education. But it's the ethic of money, the idea that money is good in itself. Uh, and what troubles me is that there are places that in the process of pursuing money really have lost their soul, that they've struck the kind of bargains that only Faust could love. David, let me ask you this question. Could it really be otherwise in this marketplace-based society of ours? Indeed, if you look at almost any sector of the society, money is the zeitgeist. You look at the health sector, we know this from you know, everything around us. You even look at, at museums, even churches are in the marketing business. I don't know why you're saying even. Well, right. I suppose this is true. Church has been trolling for converts for a very long time. Um, but higher education, at least in theory, is about finding an island in which it's possible to speak truth to power, a, a counter market force, if you please. Um, and we have precious few of those in the society. And it, it's certainly going to be the case that great chunks of higher education are given over to the values of efficiency, competition, leanness, meanness, uh, specialization, all those kinds of things that make for narrowly defined market success. But the hope is that there's somebody who's the keeper of the flame, somebody who's not exactly the medieval monk, but somebody who's actually worried about questions that don't have immediate payoff, because otherwise we're all going to be serious losers. But of course it is so interesting that you do show great respect for the wise, the balanced entrepreneur in academia. Indeed. And I think the balance is exactly the, the task. That's the, the trick is to find that way of maneuvering the realities of the marketplace, not imagining that you're Thoreau anymore, that you're going to build a better mousetrap and people will come, uh, but that you actually are able to offer something of value that people want. And if you, to use the, the deliberately market language that Bill Durden, who's the entrepreneur turned president of Dickinson College, a Pennsylvania liberal arts college, uses basically you know your product. Uh, and you don't say to the market, we're going to give you whatever you want. It is to say, we have something that's really of value. 
Uh, and we're going to make it as available as we can, and we're going to trumpet our strengths, and we're going to make our case to you. But at the end of the day, we're going to listen to you, but we're not going to bend. We're not going to do whatever it is that the market demands. And, and again, that's the balance to strike, not saying we're above this, because nobody is above this. And to make the claim that the market is irrelevant is to create that kind of hypocrisy that novels of manners about academia are all about. And if you just become a servant of the market, then you might as well be a for-profit university, because they do it better. And they do a fine job at what they're about doing. But walking that line, that's the, that's the trick. And that's what a lot of the stories aim to show, those places that succeed and those places that, that don't succeed. And but I still want to ask, bottom line, can't help but say that. Bottom line, do you think that uh, when all is said and done, those who you think, those leaders in education, higher education, and you name them, you think have arrived at that balance, do you think that they'll survive in reality? I'm, long run, long right. run, and be honest, as I know you will be. No, I'm, I am, if I weren't to some extent an optimist, it would be very hard to write a book that was really an obituary for a bygone time. And let me answer that question broadly. You always think that the zeitgeist of the moment is the zeitgeist and nothing is ever going to change. Right? The Soviet Union was going to be forever. We were always going to live in, in, in that world. The universe was going to behave according to certain laws of economics that John Keynes laid down a long time ago. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but one thing we do know is that tomorrow is going to be different from today. And I think the answer to that question depends on the kind of public conversation that people have about higher education now. Because what's really important about your question, what's telling about your question, is how fragile this present moment is, how crucial this present moment is, how essential it is that there be voices who speak up in the conversation, not just for support higher education because it's productive, support higher education because it's going to contribute to the economy, but support higher education because it's where ideas come from. Now, you're saying then that um, when you talk about times changing, climates of opinion, you're saying that this, this question of the bottom line and the damage it has done in mm -hmm. many institutions is not a function of the nature of human nature. You're talking about something that passes. You talked about the Soviet Union that's no longer a threat. But I wonder whether those are more, aren't more ephemeral matters than what leads to this selling of one's soul. Well, again, thinking in, in large Arthur Schlesinger-like terms, um, you go through periods of time which we are a publicly, public regarding country. Uh, we had one of those periods in the 30s. We had one of those periods in the 60s. We had one of those periods in the 1860s, which is where a lot of these great public universities come from. I think that the conversation now is about the direction in which we're going to be heading. And uh, whether or not we become the entrepreneurial society full stop, or we become a society where there's a place for the, for the public commons, uh, that's a, there's a critical juncture. Uh, we get to decide that now. And on the basis of that decision, the answer to your question, not just for higher education, but for a whole lot of other services in the society, is going to arise. Is everything going to be privatized? Are we basically going to be buying, even as we do now, parents who are sending their kids to, to public high schools are buying art classes, music classes, gym, libraries, all the rest of that, AP classes. The school, has been, the school has been hollowed out by these. Now, is there somebody who's going to be able to stand up and say, this is, this is a scandal, this is a shame, we're losing out enormously. Well, at the other end of the spectrum, optimistic story. State after, state after state is moving closer and closer to universal pre-kindergarten. Well, if I were going to invest in education, if I were going to invest in the future of children, that's yeah. really where I would invest. And that's what states are concluding that they're going to do. And what's the state in the United States that's done the best job in this area? Not Massachusetts, not New York, not California. It's Oklahoma. And what state has done second best? It's Georgia. Zell Miller in an earlier incarnation. Zell Miller the kind. Uh, is the reason why you have something approximating universal pre-kindergarten in Georgia. So I don't think this is one of those inevitability stories. I find this just not very interesting. History is contingent. This is a contingent moment. 
And the answer is going to be a whole lot more complicated than yes or no. History, say you say, is contingent, and you quote our friend Arthur Schlesinger. What will change? What must change to enable the position you take to be, uh, uh, for us to say, yes, he was right? Well, for starters, leadership needs to find its voice. If you ask anybody of a certain age, what's the great political speech of our time? They'll point to one speech, Mario Cuomo's 1984 Democratic Convention Address, the Cities on the Hill speech. It was an enormously wonderful speech, um, and it was perhaps issued at the wrong moment. But is there room for such a speech? Well, one hopes, whether from a political leader, uh, not necessarily a president, someone in the Senate, a governor, uh, or an educational leader. Uh, we, can, we can hope right here in New York that John Sexton turns out to be that kind of voice. Um, he has been in his relatively early years as, as president. Um, Mark Udoff in Texas has been a great voice for public education. Um, the hope is that those people begin to get heard. The hope is that there are champions. Why did early childhood education suddenly enter the agenda as a serious policy area in these unlikely places. Because there were champions. There were people who looked out and saw how important this was. Well, higher education has a huge advantage in making this appeal because everybody either benefited from a good higher education or knows somebody down the block who benefited or who has a kid who they want to benefit. It's not a hard sell to make. It just requires somebody, some bodies with the energy and the, the wit and the charisma to begin making that sell. Well, I think you're right, of course, in saying that our friend John Sexton might well be that person in the private sector. Now, how do you balance these, uh, these needs and the successes and the failures between private and public institutions? Well, what's happened, not very surprisingly, is that in the past 20 years, there's been an enormous divergence in fortunes. Go back to 1980 again, and all the conversation was, will the private institutions survive? Their investments are tanks. They had no money. Um, you know, the handful of places, the Harvards were doing fine. NYU had just emerged from something approximating bankruptcy. People forget that in 1976, if it weren't for Mullah Macaroni Company, there would not be an NYU today. And the public universities were riding high. The states were paying huge chunks of what it is that uh, the, the costs of the education there. And tuitions were low. Uh, that's a very different universe today. Tuitions go up, up, up um, in the public universities. They approximate the cost of private universities. Um, the private universities benefited enormously from the run-up of the stock market in the 1990s. Um, they're now as healthy as can be, at least the, the leading 50 of them are as healthy as, as can be. Um, and what's going to happen? Um, my fear is that even in a university like Berkeley, perhaps the most distinguished public university in the world, if I can be a little chauvinistic. You are chauvinistic. I am chauvinistic, but if you look at the ratings, you'll see that I have reason to be chauvinistic across the board. Um, my but, first teaching job was at Berkeley, well, so we, there. Mi we miss you. Uh, if you, look at, if you look at Berkeley, one of my colleagues said, you know, the way present trends are going, it's going to be as if a neutron bomb hit here. The buildings will be standing, wonderful, the library will be there, but there will be no students because the institution can't afford them. They'll be bid away by other places because as tuition rises and financial aid doesn't, it becomes cheaper to go to Harvard or Princeton or Yale or Columbia than it does to go to Berkeley. Imagine that. Um, and it, that's an institution that commands enormous loyalty on the part of its faculty and draws students for the name and the reputation of the institution. But name and reputation will get you to sacrifice only so many dollars. So I'm really worried about the fate of public higher education. I don't know the only way at this moment that I can see public institutions succeeding. This moment is to borrow from our earlier conversation if they start looking more like their private cousins. That is, if they set their tuition rates higher, if they aggressively pursue donations, if they find ways of substantially increasing their financial aid so they have a need-based high tuition system um, and are able to compete on a level playing field with the Harvards and Yales. Because the state 
has more and more gotten out of that business. Why? In part because of the market mentality we've been discussing, also because of the hugely rising costs of health care at the state level, and prison care in some states, prisons in some states. We spent, in California particularly, infinite numbers of dollars locking all sorts of folks up for unconscionable periods of time. That costs money. You know, we sort of, every once in a while, joke about turning one of the state university campuses into another prison that would probably save everybody some, some funds. But it's not a joke. It's a very sad story. When tuition at the community colleges increased just to $20 a credit unit last year, $20 a credit unit, which is from $12 a credit unit, that's roughly $100 a semester, 150,000 fe 150, fewer students than expected showed up at the door. Um, my micro sample at the public policy school at Berkeley where I teach, we surveyed the students who didn't come. Why didn't you come? Why did you go to wherever you went to? 90% of them had the same answer, money. You know, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford to be here. So the, that crisis in public higher education is now. What uh, impact is there, and this is a little bit off the subject, but consequential. Given the struggle for meeting the bottom line, um, what impact does it have upon educational leadership? And in, I mean, I, I'm a Columbia person who remembers Nicholas Murray Butler and the lead he took quite frequently in public policies. Overall, as you look at all of the institutions you've surveyed, what has happened to leadership in the academy when you deal with a public policy? We're old enough to remember that in the 1960s, James Reston, Scotty Reston, was the most influential columnist in the New York Times. In 1967, he wrote an op-ed column which he urged the Democratic 19 to, to draft as its candidate, a distinguished leader with a distinguished career who'd spoken out eloquently and early against the Vietnam War. The person here is the Democrats to draft was Kingman Brewster, Yale's president, president of Yale. Now, just wrap your mind around the concept that Maureen Dowd or Bill Sapphire are going to come up with the 2008 version of Kingman Brewster. It's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen for a very simple reason. It's hard to speak truth to power, which risks offense, if your hand is constantly out and you're the begging bowl is pointed in the direction of power. And that's what's happened. There hasn't been a serious leader in the public sphere who's spoken out on any issue that I can think of other than higher education since the days of people like Bob Drynan and, and Theodore Hesburgh in the, in the 1970s. Both interestingly priests, both interestingly heads of Catholic institutions. Um, it's a long, that's a long stretch. Uh, and I think it really does relate very much to this issue. You're going to offend the alums. You're going to offend the potential donors. You're going to offend the government. Gosh, help us. You're going to offend the government if you behave in this way. And it's very hard for any one leader to go it alone. It's very hard for any one person to be courageous. In this so way. that, in a sense, it is not just the raising of money and the bottom line. It is also the need not to rock the boat. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you want to see academic freedom, turn on the radio. Don't go to the university. Tell me what you mean by that. Look at the internet. Read the blogs. That's where, I mean, there are more ideas coming out of the blogs than there are in the president's office of any public or private institution that I can think of. You want to sort of hear interesting, cutting-edge uh, news about the world, go turn on Jon Stewart. Don't listen to the talking heads on, on the Jim Lehrer show. He has much more interesting things to say about this set of issues. When I met with the presidents of the 60 leading research universities last spring, um, I said to them, how many of you listen to watch John Stewart comedy on Comedy Central? They looked at me and I said, so how many of you know who John Stewart is? And nobody raised his or her hand. I said, for shame. I said, there's got to be somebody in this audience. I said, looking at Larry Summers from Harvard, who thinks himself a a kind of a public figure. There's got to be somebody in this audience, John Sexton, who can go on John Stewart and shine and talk to real people um, in ways that are going to get a, a, a message across. But ideas 
more ideas are happening, more new energy is being spun out outside the academy, I would argue, in all sorts of unconventional ways, than certainly in the leadership of higher education. Then I have to ask the follow-up question. What does this say about the significance, about the impact of the world of higher education upon our society at large? Well, I think it's, I think it's fraught and problematic. And I think it's important not to confuse what it is that our esteemed presidents and provosts and chancellors have to say or don't have to say with what serious academic voices have to say. And they do exist. And there are smart people um, scattered across universities, big ones, small ones, who speak out uh, at the local level as well as the national and international level. And that, it seems to I mean, the, the imp and those folks are also training, uh, we hope, a next generation of folks who are going to be tough thinkers and yes, inquiring but, minds. But you see, I, I would challenge you, and I'm sure you can meet the challenge, to name them because I think of Chomsky and then I drew a blank. Uh, you, you gave me one way well, out. Just, you talked about local. Let's just, well, let's, let's just take your, your friendly institution to the north, of which you're so fond, Columbia. Look at Todd Gitlin. Just arrived. Ah, from NYU. Migrating, migrating uptown. And where did he come from before he was at NYU, Richard? Berkeley. Oh, God. You, uh, you won't let that go. <laughs> sure. Todd Gitlin is an important no, right. voice. Right. One voice. That you can Do pick. you really think that there are many academics, primarily academics today, who make an impact upon our social being? In fact, you said just the opposite. You used uh, James Reston's column about Kingman Brewster, and who would, who would be in Kingman Brewster's place? No, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. There is no academic leader no one in a position of authority in an American college or university that I can think of but, but, who occupies but, anything like that role. That isn't to say that academics aren't still functioning as public intellectuals. But, but, that's, but that's really what I want to question you about, David, because it seems to me that that's the important point, that public intellectuals, we can see journalists more readily than academics in that position. No? Well, take a look at who writes for the New York Review of Books or the New Yorker. Consider, as a very different example, Henry Louis Gates, uh, who migrates for a month from Harvard. Which university to um, which university? To, well, he migrates from Harvard to the New York Times um, and writes an extraordinarily good series of op-ed pieces during his, uh, during his stint there. Uh, the, the naming game is probably less interesting than the fact that there are, there's a greater plurality of voices. The New York Review of Books is, seems to be enjoying a renaissance, but it's read by the same usual suspects. The New Yorker is read by a larger group of, of usual suspects. And there was a piece by Nick Lemon, journalist turned academic, uh, another Columbia person. Uh, Harvard, very fine originally. Piece. Harvard originally, very, I very, must very admit. Fine, very fine piece um, on the Bush administration um, that ran in the last issue. You'd be hard pressed to pick up any of the leading journals of opinion and not find smart academics saying interesting and provocative things. You'd be very hard pressed to find on the serious talk shows when those kinds of conversations not happening. I don't think that's the so problem. You don't think that it's changed? No, I don't. I, well, the, what's changed is the same thing that's changed with the relationship between net network TV, cable, and the internet. That is, a, a handful of voices don't enjoy the same privilege of prestige. There are more voices being heard, right? Matt Drudge is, is competing with the classic political pundits in this, in this world. But we still hear the academics still being Talk about evolution from lower to higher form. Larry, but Larry Sabato and Matt Drudge are sort of slugging it out for the attention of different audiences. Sabato at Virginia, you know, Drudge at, you know, at, at Ponscombe level. Your concerns about the academy then, really where, where do you focus them? You had to pick the areas of which you were most concerned in the couple of minutes we have left. I'm most concerned about the education of the next generation. Because my fear is that this is a generation of students that grew up 
until 9-11 and in a time of unparalleled prosperity. And they grew up, by and large, not knowing hardship, not knowing danger, not knowing risk. And they grew up expecting that they could buy what they needed. And they come to the university and they expect that the same kinds of, of pleasures that they've had, whether it's the wired world of everything, uh, the sushi bar, the rock climbing wall, the espresso bar, all that's going to be in these institutions. Last year, universities spent and colleges sp spent $13 billion, raised $13 billion in bonds. Moody's estimates that half of that money went for these kinds of frill activities. So what isn't happening? Full-time faculty aren't getting hired. Adjuncts are replacing them, adjuncts with less loyalty to the institution. How could it be otherwise since the institution has no loyalty to them? Students are migrating away from the liberal arts and the institutions aren't mounting an effective argument in behalf of the liberal arts. So I'm concerned about both the quality of the education and who's getting educated. Because the other thing that's happened is there's a yawning gap opening between the education of the rich and the education of everybody else in the, the hundred most prestigious colleges and universities. That's a pretty big list. Seventy-five percent of the students come from the top twenty-five percent of the income bracket. Sounds like our income tax laws. Two percent come from the bottom quarter. David Kerb, you worry me when you say that, but you don't worry me when you've written such a um, hell of a good book. Shakespeare, Einstein, and the bottom line. I appreciate your joining me on The Open Mind today. Richard, thanks so much for having me. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Now. For nearly a half century now, our purpose here has been to provide the light of reasoned discourse rather than the heat of verbal battle. That surfaces clearly, and as they saw it, the new paperback collection of conversations from the open mind, with a foreword by Mario Cuomo, and with memorable words from Martin Luther King, Jonas Salk, Betty Friedan, Malcolm X, Bill Moyers, Rudolph Giuliani, Norman Mailer, and dozens more. Read the book. I think you'll like it. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America, Andrew DeFinn.